Hello and welcome to our webinar, Virtual Resources with Real Solutions, Person-Centered Tools for Support During COVID-19, offered by the National Association of State, State Head Injury Administrators. I am Gabriella Lauren Soto, NASHA Training and Education Committee Chair, and Maria Crowley, NASHA Professional Development Director, is our webinar organizer. Thank you for joining us. If you are unfamiliar with NASHA, we are a nonprofit organization created to assist state government in promoting partnerships and building systems to meet the needs of individuals with brain injury and their families. For your convenience, a GoToWebinar user guide is available for download from the NASHA website. This is a great resource for making the most of your live webinar experiences. Handouts of today's presentation are available for download. Check your attendee control panel for handouts pane. To ask questions during the webinar, please enter it in the questions pane on your control panel, and our organizer will forward your question to our speaker after the presentation. If we run out of time, the presenter will respond to your questions via email. Certificates of attendance are available for today's event and the webinar will be archived for later access. Today, I am excited to introduce to you our presenter. Anastasia Edvinston currently works for the Maryland Behavioral Health Administration and serves as the project coordinator for the TBI grant, coordinating training initiatives on TBI, person-centered thinking, and planning for providers in the fields of aging, mental health, and addiction, and law enforcement. Ms. Edmiston has worked in rehabilitation and brain injury for over 30 years with a master's in rehabilitation counseling. She is a certified rehabilitation counselor, mental health first aid instructor, and a certified person-centered thinking trainer through the Learning Community for Person-Centered Practices. A bio of our presenter is also included in our handout pane. Welcome, Anastasia. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, thank you, Maria. And thank you for the National um, Association of State Head Injury Administrators for sponsoring this webinar. I also want to acknowledge and thank Michael Schmoll and his colleagues at the Learning Community for Person-Centered Practices for their support and assistance with the content of this webinar. In addition, I want to thank um, my person-centered training um, partner, Melissa Scales Hamilton, for her support as I developed this presentation for you today. Um, we're going to ask you two questions. Um, so we're going to have two polls. Uh, the, the first thing we want to know is a little bit about you. Um, or how do you identify you a person with lived experience, a brain injury, family member, a caregiver, community service provider of brain injury, or other community service provider, or another category altogether? So if you just want to take a second and let us know who you are. Okay, so we have community providers, 45%, others 35%. And if you think about it, put in the chat who you are, what you do, if you are in that other category. Um, we have uh, nobody, no family members right now. Uh, we do have some folks who lived experience. Fantastic, thank you for filling that out. My next question, our next poll question is, um, we would, I'd like to know if you are familiar with a one-page profile. It's a person-centered discovery tool. So just yes or no, are you familiar?
Okay, so 38% of you are and 62% um, of you are not. So this is fantastic um, because for those of you who are familiar, uh, this is a repurposing um, of the one page profile to use during the time of COVID-19. And for those of you who are not familiar, which is most of you, uh, this will be an introduction to a tool that you can use for today's purposes as well as for um, other um, situations and settings. So Maria, you'll be sharing the the screen of my slides. Stasia, I've turned the presenter rights over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, I seem to have your, there we go. Now I see it, hang on. Sorry, folks, we did practice this. Okay. All right. So first thing I'm going to talk about is what is the one page profile? So the one page profile was developed by Helen Sanderson over a decade ago, and she developed the one page profile to provide her daughter's teacher with a brief introduction to her daughter so that she would know what's important to her and how to best support her in the educational setting. Since then, Thousands of one-page profiles have been developed for a variety of reasons and settings. The one-page profile always has three components. <clears throat> it's a positive introduction of the person, that's number one. Number two is it includes information on what matters to the person. And are you all not still seeing my screen? No. We, we can't can see it. You can? Not we cannot. see it. Hmm. Okay. As I pulled it up, current slide. Hmm. How about now? Not yet. Huh. Um, hmm. I am not sure why that's the case. I can't seem to get out of the window that I'm in. Do you want to just bring it up, Maria? On your end? Sure. Just let me know when you want me to advance. Okay. So I am still talking about the ingredients of the one page profile. So it is a positive introduction of the person. Number two is what matters to that person or what is important to that person. And then number three is how best to support that person given the purpose of the one page profile. Next. So today we're gonna to talk about how to use the one page profile, which is called a person-centered discovery tool with people living with brain injury during the COVID-19 epidemic. How to support each other in isolation, choices among constraints, because this is a very constraining situation that we all find ourselves in for various reasons. Controlling what we can, uh, supports and accommodations for the present and beyond. Next. So over the past few months, there have been, as I said, challenges and changes to our physical health, to our routines, and to our work and families. Um, behavioral health issues can emerge or become worse, such as anxiety and depression. And these are the two most common mental health issues for people living with or without a history of brain injury. And so these are the things we need to be mindful of for, for all of us. And there are concerns in general regarding the use of substances to cope with these challenging times due the, to the isolation we're experiencing as we abide by our state's guidance in flattening the curve. Now, this new normal really throws us all into routines that we weren't expecting. Next. So 
So access to supports and services, you know, for people living with a brain injury, many of our routines have been so hard won, learned, mastered, and routinized over time. And to have those routines upended literally overnight can be really, really tough. On top of that, there are worries about health, access to services. If I'm a person living with a brain injury, I'm taking medication, say, for seizure control. How difficult will it be for me to get my blood work done monthly as my doctor prescribes? Is paratransit running now? What about my older adult family member who provides me transportation and takes me to my appointments? You know, so I'm also worried for them. If, if I have um, older family members who have traditionally supported me, now I'm concerned about their risk of developing COVID-19 as well as my own. Next slide. <clears throat> So at our second virtual uh, state traumatic brain injury advisory board meeting since we've been in lockdown here in Maryland, um, our board members were asked uh, who were living with brain injury, how you doing in, in this time? How are you doing? So I'd like to share some of those comments uh, with you. So Maria, if you can go to the next slide. So everything is new and new learning is challenging. And somebody else said, not knowing when this is going to end is the most difficult thing about this. And it is a stark reminder of the feelings immediately following the brain injury. When the future, future recovery is unknown, it is somewhat of a post-traumatic stress disorder response to those early days after the injury. For, so for that person, it really felt like a rewind back to square one. Um, and this is somebody who's living many, many, many years post-injury. Yeah quite successfully. Um, next slide. Um, and I think this person's speaking for a lot of us, you know, with or without a brain injury, but for them, figuring out how to use technology, and you saw a really great example of that just a moment ago, um, the technology we're now using to communicate, conduct work, and socialize, it can be very difficult and anxiety provoking. Um, the importance of a routine cannot be underestimated for individuals who've sustained a brain injury. And the stay-at-home orders make normal routine much more difficult to implement. And then I ended up with um, one of our advisory board members who says that they are feeling blessed to have friends and family that provide support and do the shopping, et cetera. And I love that because I think the one-page profile is a tool that we can use to really make that concrete support for each other. So next slide. I'm gonna share with you um, two examples of the one page profile for the pre-COVID area, just so you can get a sense of its various uses. And then we're gonna move into um, how one could use the same template for a, um, a person who's experiencing a hospitalization because of um, COVID-19. So you can go to the next slide. And this person is Jean. And this is actually based on a one-page profile that my siblings and I created for a mom who's living with advanced dementia. Uh, we had it in hand the day she moved into a skilled nursing facility. And I watched carefully as the charge nurse put it in the front of the brand new chart. And then we took another copy of it and we put it on um, the door of her closet in her room. And many of us understand that people living with dementia can become agitated when they're scared and they can become scared even during routine nursing care. And the staff at the skilled nursing facility learned very quickly from the profile what they could use to help de-escalate any agitation that my mom started to experience when they were providing you know, routine care. So they would talk about um, now, this picture is not my mom. The real life picture has her surrounded by her four children, four grandchildren and two grand dogs with everybody's name, where they live and their ages. And so it really provided a rich base with which to engage my mom and made her smile. The other thing that the profile gave them was information about her career. She had been a nurse her whole life. And that was the magic ticket to really help her calm down when they were giving her care that was uncomfortable, she was bed bound. And so they will say to her, you know, Jean, I know this is really uncomfortable, but as a nurse, you know we have to do this to prevent decubitus ulcers. Calmed right down, calmed right down. So these really are good in action and I can attest to that personally. Next slide. 
So this is Pat, um, and, and Pat really is representative of um, many people uh, living with brain injury um, who I have known and worked with throughout the year, years. Um, in the past, I've worked as an employment specialist. So in this scenario, Pat um, is a person living with a brain injury. They are in community, live with family, and are successfully working in a competitive setting and receiving ongoing support and employment uh, services from a brain injury provider. Um, and just take a look at the desired traits and undesired traits that this um, person, Pat, is looking for in a supporter. So in order to have a good match for that support, um, support employment specialist, they need to be kind and patient and really need to take the time to get to know me and my dad. And so um, I have to say that, and several of the people I'm thinking about, you know, that was really taken into consideration, um, really good matches are made, and that is so important when we're trying to support people. Um, and we're gonna go back to Pat's um, one-page profile re revive, re revised for the um, COVID-19 um, situation. Uh, next slide. So these are Michael Schmoll's um, slides. Again, thank you to, to Michael. Um, developing a one-page profile for the COVID-19 healthcare setting. And this can be done via Zoom or telephone, FaceTime. Uh, the person who is assisting the individual and the individual, if possible, should have some of those tools that are in your handouts, the template and the instructions. Um, and so really our goal is once you get off this phone call, you can sit uh, with yourself or your family members or anybody that you support with a brain injury or without and develop a one page um, profile should you, um, you know, need to be, go into hospital for COVID-19. So next slide, please. So we always begin with questions. Um, you know, we start the conversation with questions. Um, where is this one-page profile going to be used? And, if, and for our purposes today, it isn't going to be in the healthcare setting. What do we want people to learn from reading it? And what do you want people to do with that learning? Um, and of course, remember that it needs to be fairly succinct and it needs to be um, something you can read really in a minute. Um, and so even the most brilliant uh, one-page profile, if it's just too unwieldy, um, it may never get used and it will be a wasted effort. So we really want to make sure that we're getting to the heart of what is important to, what is important for, and who that person is. What do we want the, the professionals to know about that person? Okay, next slide. What do we know about the COVID-19 healthcare setting? So um, I don't know about you, but I open up the paper, uh, any paper, and there are stories of our, um, our heroes, you know, the folks who are providing the hands-on care in hospital settings. We know they're very busy. We know it's overwhelming for them. Um, we know that they want to provide the best care and they don't have a lot of time, especially early on um, when this first hit. And they do want the tools. They are interested in doing what they can to help the people that they're supporting in the hospital feel less anxious and more comfortable. Next. So I went to, and, and you can as well, because I left um, up on the slide, uh, the link to the New York Times article that profiles many healthcare workers um, who are doing work across the country. And the one that jumped out to me in, rela in relation to reinforcing the idea of how helpful a one-page profile can be is um, from Kayla uh, Suda. She's an ER technician in New Bedford, Mass. And she said, the most intense experience in fighting COVID-19 for me is bearing witness to what true bedside manner and healthcare looks like despite fear. So uh, her next statement, she goes on to say, when my coworkers get into the rooms and talk with the patients, it's like the virus doesn't exist. We joke, we laugh, we talk about their families and, and person-centered thinking, we say, you know, we are not our diagnosis. And so she understands that. And so how helpful would it be for her and her colleagues to have that one page profile so that they can know what to laugh about, what to joke about, something about the family, to start that connection right off the bat and to help uh, reduce people's anxiety. Okay, next. So what will work? Next slide. 
So I just want to give you some really great examples of one-page profiles that will work in the, in the COVID-19 healthcare setting. And I just want to um, note that um, all the, uh, personal information and pictures have been changed as needed to meet HIPAA requirements. And so the first person that I'm going to share um, his profile with you is Sam. And Sam is living with uh, esophageal cancer. He was always somebody to take care of others, um, quite a joker. And when reading his one-page profile, what you see is that his family is very important to him. In how to best support him in the hospital, you can learn of the five key things um, that as a healthcare professional, how to distract him during health procedures, tell him what you're going to do before you do it, who to contact when he's upset and have those numbers handy. Um, for him, having medications and chocolate pudding or ice cream makes it so much easier to swallow. So those are things that um, are very critical for staff to know about. Sam, and you can see those are his daughters with him. Next. This is Josie. Um, Josie is known to be a devoted mother, grandmother, and valued member of her church. Uh, she also enjoyed her career as an OBGYN nurse, and she enjoys talking about this time in her life and is very aware of the interworkings of the healthcare system. Like with Jean, this is a quick entry into developing rapport uh, with Josie. Her given name is Josephine Colvin. That's on the medical record, but she wants to be called Josie, not Josephine, or Mrs. Colvin. She does not like being in pain, so it is okay to give her medication to manage it, even if it makes her drowsy. She would also like uh, people to wrap a sheet or blanket around her pillow to help her avoid sweating. That makes her more comfortable. Okay, thanks. Next. This is Marty or Martin. Uh, he's a great guy. He experienced a traumatic brain injury in his late teens and is now in his 30s. Um, Marty has been in and out of a variety of services. He's also had a period of incarceration as, uh, you know, unfortunately many folks living with brain injury, um, you know, find themselves in similar uh, circumstances. Um, and it is important to him to have as much control over his life as possible. Marty does not like to be told what to do, but he wants to be informed about what is going to happen and before it happens. So give that heads up, explain in detail while it is happening. This includes medical treatments and tests. He also appreciates having his walker at his bedside. If it is not, he will try to walk to it and without support is at high risk for falling. That's so important for healthcare staff to know. Marty gets upset if he's not able to talk to people, especially his daily conversations with his mom. So Marty likes to have his phone charged and nearby so he can make phone calls to her as he wants. Next slide. Uh, so Marty is a, a person who, who smokes um, and which puts him at higher risk for medical concerns, which, which leads us to the COVID-19 passport. Um, this is Marty's passport. Now, this version of the health passport is still in draft form. There are different formats you can check out on the internet. Most of those are longer than the one page. This version is intended to be on the flip side of the one page profile for use during the COVID-19 related hospitalization. So in Marty's case, the passport lets the healthcare provider know that he's living with a mental illness as well as a brain injury and takes medications for both. It includes medical information, current COVID-19 related symptoms such as high fever, risk factors, in his case, asthma. It could be age. Um, you would want to know if somebody's over 65 if you were filling this out for somebody or with somebody. And in addition, medications, allergies, whether or not the person has a do not resuscitate, and that's directive, psychiatric or otherwise, um, or a healthcare proxy. Um, the one page version of the health passport will be posted on the National Center for Applied Person Centered Practices and Systems, or NCAPS, and the link to NCAPS COVID 19 resource page is at the end of this presentation. Next slide. This is Jim. Jim is a kind and gentle person who likes to make everyone feel welcome. Jim is a smoker, so if he were to be admitted to the hospital, he may need a nicotine patch. Like Marty, uh, Jim has people he likes to speak with, especially his friend Holly, so he would want his phone to be within reach. Jim also has to have his Mountain Dew or Pepsi at all times. Due to smoking, um, Jim has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and he has behavioral health challenges as a result of living with a bipolar disorder. Jim also is living with intellectual disabilities. 
And so you can see in how best to support him. Um, there's quite a litany there and he does work. He does have his own apartment. He is engaged and getting married. So those are some conversation starters right there. Okay, next. This is Joanne. Um, and those who know Joanne say that she's a very determined woman whose Catholic faith is very important to her. Feeling respected and in control is important to her. She must also um, have a rosary and prayer book on, by her bedside. Although Joanne is diagnosed and living with dementia and does struggle with the memory issues, she wants to be given information and details about her health care. If Joanne seems panicked or out of sorts, putting your hand on her arm and saying, Joanne, stop, helps her to refocus on what you need to do. Such a simple, simple strategy and so important. Her son, Sheldon, is a good source of information and wants to be kept informed. She's also hard of hearing, so make sure she has her hearing aids in. In addition to dementia, she's also living with Parkinson's and has a history of stroke. So that, as we know, is a form of acquired brain injury. And um, as a result of her cognitive issues related to her um, health conditions, it is hard for her to share her basic health information. And thankfully, uh, she has a family who were able to help fill out this uh, one-page profile for the staff. Next. So I was really curious, um, especially since a lot of folks have not um, used or been familiar with the one page profile, if you wouldn't mind jotting down in chat um, anything that is new or surprising to you uh, so far that we've discussed today. I'll just give you a few minutes. Okay, so somebody has not seen the profile before. Great, thanks for sharing. And I'm going to move on, but if there's anybody else who has something you know that they want to comment on, um, we'd really like to know it. I mean, when I first started using this, um, it really was an eye opener. I did use it in my personal life. Okay, thank you. So next slide. So getting started, um, let's, let's review some of the questions. And you need to know who has the answers to the questions. Whose input do you need? Um, can the person whose profile uh, is, is being created, are they able to answer all the questions? Do you need to bring in others to assist? And if so, who are those other folks? Family members, close friends, caregivers? Who can tell you what others like and admire about the person? Okay, next. And as you're doing this, you know, take take lots of notes. Um, you want to know what people say uh, about you, what you're good at. Um, if someone was to give you a compliment, what would they say? Uh, what are your good qualities? You know, it's so hard for a lot of us um, to rattle them off. You know, we're not used to singing our own praises. So this is really a nice um, opportunity to have a conversation, you know, even before a crisis happens. It's, um, it's a really nice thing to hear what other people have to say about you that you take for granted or, or weren't aware that people were registering about you. Okay, next slide. What is important to you? That is a critical piece. Um, I hope that's already evident from what we've discussed so far, but who does the person need to stay in contact with while they're in the hospital? And what's the best way to do that? Phone numbers, email. Um, what helps you feel better when you are sick or upset? What helps you wind down, relax, or sleep? And we're gonna go into more detail in a second. Um, any spiritual practices that help you feel grounded and what that helps you feel um, valued and respected. Next. So what does good support look like? In the COVID-19 uh, healthcare settings, people will be isolated. It's just the nature of this very contagious virus. And we all know how impactful being completely alone for several days can be on a person. So in finding out what is important to the person, you first want to ask, who do you want to be in contact with and how often? You know, they may have a, a parent that they live with 
but maybe once a week check-in is fine, but they really wanna talk to their friend or their support staff on a daily basis. Um, who are the people that need to know how they're doing? Uh, who would they want to be contacted again every day and, and what is their contact information? Um, we do want the person to feel safe. So what helps, what makes you feel better when you are sick? How can we help you when you are upset and what allows you to fall asleep and, uh, and stay and sleep well? Um, the spiritual practices, you know, we touched upon that with Joanne. Uh, she needed her rosary and prayer book. Um, but different people have different things that are important to them. Um, and that's something that uh, you can learn about as you go through the, the template of the one page profile. So next. So some other details about what does good support, good support look like. Um, are there things that make you feel calm or safe? And I say that again, because Michael Schmoll reminds us that this is really important to know if the individual is a trauma survivor. And for individuals living with a brain injury, it is not uncommon for individuals to have a co-occurring trauma or to actually been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think the earlier comment from our advisory board member really brought that home, how it just was just a re-traumatizing time for them, um, this time of COVID-19. How should the nurses and other staff communicate with you? Do you need details? I mean, I wanna read my whole medical chart if it was me, but some people just want just the facts, a brief summary of what's going on, and then they're good to go. Um, and we're gonna be looking at this through a brain injury informed lens very shortly. Do you want step-by-step -step details of how testing is gonna be performed or do you just want to get it over and done with? Okay, next slide. So you really wanna look for the four or five or six most important things for the staff to know um, in each section. Uh, of the template and use that plain language. And, and I think I also want to add, you know, especially for folks living with brain injury, um, a lot of us, if we go to the hospital and we have some kind of procedure, healthcare uh, professionals will also ask us to provide a number on a scale of one to 10 for pain. And you might want to ask the person if this works for them or if there are other ways that we should know that they are in pain and how acute the pain is. Um, so it, again, just asking, don't, taking, don't take anything for granted. And when you've completed your draft, read it out loud. And again, it should only take you a minute. Okay, next. So you read it out loud, you shared it with a person, you get feedback and edit based on what they tell you. Like, yeah, we missed that, or I really would like this if I'm in the hospital. Um, and if possible, add a photo, if the person is comfortable with it, um, because that really helps uh, the staff person you know, at a glance know who that person is. Okay, next. So in the hospital, put it where it will be seen. And we've already covered this, but it bears repeating. Um, closet doors or right over the bed is often an excellent place for something like this. So the one-page profile can be put on a bulletin board if that's available. And if the person is going to be moved, and this happens a lot. I, I have a friend who is actually in the hospital right now with COVID-19. Um, they started in the ICU and thankfully have been moved to a step-down unit. So if that happens and that there is a one-page one profile, you want that to go with the person because it's a whole new staff. So you want them also to be able to have that tool to connect with that person um, right away, you know, as soon as possible. And I, again, just want to make sure you're aware that we have all the tools that you need to actually put together one page profile for yourself or for somebody in your life in the handouts pane. Okay, next slide. Um, so here's tips for improving the one page description. And that's something that you might not know until unfortunately the person is hospitalized and you need to revise it. Any new learning. So um, the person may say, well, now that I'm actually here, this would be useful. I would love ice chips by the bed. Um, ask those providing care to know any new learning. So preferred positioning. 
music that is soothing as opposed to getting folks revved up? Are there new phone numbers um, that I need to have uh, available uh, so that the person can be in touch with um, significant others? So you just want to leave some space on the template if possible as things change and, and um, develop. Next slide. So why creating a one-page profile is so important for people living um, with a brain injury? It gives people and their loved ones a measure of control in a time of uncertainty. So having this plan in place, maybe you'll never need it. That is our wish, um, of course. But having that measure of preparation can be sometimes very settling for folks. Um, allows for thinking through, you know, what is important for me and how could it be applied in, in a hospital setting? Especially if we're living with common brain injury related issues such as memory for new information. And that's typically what people will, with, living with brain injuries will report. You know, new information is really hard for me to hang on to. What if somebody's living with impulse control or emotional dysregulation because uh, the damage occurred to their frontal and temporal lobes? How can we help support them in that case? And, and what if there are physical sequelae of their brain injury, such as contractures, uh, visual field cuts and double vision, or ataxia, which happens uh, when there's some damage to the brain that helps us control our movements. Um, so people might have trouble controlling a purposeful um, stretch of the arm, a grab of the cup. So we, we would want to be able to have some strategies for folks. Um, to use if they're living with these or any other kind of brain injury related sequelae. These are not inclusive, of course, these are just examples of, and I'm gonna expand on them in a moment. Uh, next slide. So for our brain injury community, this can be done with family members, with friends. Um, we have a brain injury waiver um, program brain injury Medicaid waiver program here in Maryland. And so people live in community homes with a few other individuals also living with brain injury and with staff. And I see as this is something that can be done around the kitchen table you know, with staff and people who are living in the, in the home kind of saying, hey, let's fill out these templates for each other and have them at the ready should we need them. You can create them on a device um, if preferred or some of us go old school and want paper. So you just print it out and I would recommend you print out several blank templates to create and refine the profile as you go along. And again, of course, no matter what form you choose, when you're happy with it, laminate it or put it in a plastic um, page protector. And use one of the examples that are in this PowerPoint as a model to refer to while creating your own or helping another person. And again, don't, no stress, nothing's written in stone. We can always uh, change things as circumstances require. Uh, or ideas come to mind. Um, next slide, please. So I broke down those three um, examples of common brain injury related challenges and I expanded a little bit on each of them. And again, this is not expansive, you know, everybody's different, but over the years, um, I found some of these strategies to be useful for people and I'm just thinking about how they could be applied in a hospital setting. So if somebody's living with a memory, maybe on their temp, their one page profile and how best to support me, you would have things like, please tell me your name every time you come to provide care, even if you were here five minutes ago. That would be really good for the staff to know every time they come in the door, hi, I'm Stacia and I'm here to check your temperature. You can ask and please allow my family to provide a large wall calendar so I can cross off the days. You know, either I'll do it or if I can't, maybe you'll need to help me. Uh, and on that will be special days that my family will make sure are in the calendar so I can remember birthdays and holidays as they occur. And you may need to remind me, especially when I'm tired, feeling really down or anxious, why I'm in the hospital. You know, time seems to lose all sense uh, under the best of circumstances when we're hospitalized. Um, so that could be a really useful orientation um, strategy. 
if somebody is living with impulse control or emotional dysregulation, some of the things you can put in the section of the one page profile, how does best support me is no surprises, please. And we saw this already in the individual's um, examples that we already discussed. Give me a heads up, talk to me through procedures such as blood draws, please explain why you're doing and what you're doing. Um, Next, don't take it personally if I yell at you or say something that is insensitive. It is okay to redirect me onto another topic and or to say how my words affect you. Of course, that is different for everybody, but we know that um, you know some of the folks that I, I've been close to who are living with brain injury, thoughts come out um, before thinking through and um, it's, it's best for others around them not to take it personally, but it's better to know why. It happening if it if it happens, um, and then remind me and help me to use my strategy of breathing. And you can always help me call a family member, friend, clergy, therapist, peer support when I'm feeling agitated. For physical issues, you know I am living with weakness on one side of my body, um, and I will need help with my positioning. You know somebody coming onto the floor that night may not be aware that the person is living with one-sided weakness, and so they may need to have that in the back of their mind when they go to provide that repositioning in the bed. Hey, I have a splint because um, I have a contracture on on one of my hands, and I need to have that on at night so that I, I won't be uncomfortable. I have ataxia. Uh, my family is going to bring my weighted spoon and fork, so please make sure I have this. I'd really like to feed myself if I can possibly do so. Um, maybe I have that right-sided visual neglect. This means I don't see too well on my right side, so make sure I'm positioned so that I can see pe people approaching me. Otherwise, I get really startled. If I have double vision, super important to have those prism glasses to help me with that and make sure they're available to me. Some people who have double vision, Maybe they're afraid they're gonna lose the glasses in the hospital. So, hey, I'm gonna bring them an eye patch. Make sure I have my eye patch on so that the double vision doesn't make me nauseous. Um, and then the last example uh, of a support uh, for somebody who's living with a condition called dysarthria. Uh, it causes my speech to become slurred and oh boy, it's worse when I am tired or upset. So what you can do to support me is remind me to slow down and over articulate when speaking if I'm starting to slow my words. Great strategies, good to know to cue somebody. Next uh, slide, please. So this is Pat revised for the COVID-19 healthcare setting. And hopefully you can tell it is the same person, um, but we are repurposing the supports its employment specialist has been providing uh, for years for the hospital staff, while educating them about the functional consequences consequences of their brain injury. Um, for example, if they seem upset or angry, it's more likely to not understand, related to not understanding what's going on or why something is happening rather than being mad in the, in the traditional uh, sense. So explaining often more than once can help Pat manage their emotions. Okay, next. Okay, I'm not gonna ask you all to do something I wouldn't do myself. So um, this month I brought my family around our dining room table and I said, I wanna update my one page profile. I have one for the employment setting and I want one if I should um, need to be hospitalized for um, COVID-19. And I have uh, two adult daughters, uh, 21 and 23 and a husband and I asked them these questions, you know, what, you, what people may like and admire about me. Um, and so, you know, you can see what's important to me is you know, my family and my animals. And um, they say, you're pretty friendly, mom. Um, you know, I have friends back since I was three and, you know, I've been in the field of brain injury services for a very long time and, and wouldn't be any place else. Um, what is important to me? So this is a reoccurring theme, if you haven't noticed, but um, most of us want to know what's going on. Uh, the more details, the better. Um, I like details. If I could read my medical chart, give it to me. Um, and also keep my family uh, informed. And I am somebody who um, identifies as a vegan, and um, please don't give me jello or anything that has dairy or animal products. Um, if I had that uh, health passport on the other side in big letters, don't give me bananas, I'm allergic to them. 
and what can you do to support me while you care for me? Uh, keep my cell phone and glasses nearby. I love podcasts. Use some product to keep that hair down. I don't want that hospital head. Um, I love fresh air. I don't care if it's middle of winter. Keep, give me a little bit of fresh air by keeping the window cracked open. Pictures of family, friends, pets in view. Um, music is very important to me. I am an amateur classical choral singer. Uh, I perform with a choral group. And I perform in musical uh, community musical theater when I can. Um, and I also have contemporary you know, artists that I love, like Bruce Springsteen or Emmylou Harris. Um, I'm, ac I'm actually, uh, you know, I'm pra practicing Catholic. Um, and so I had to say to my family, if things go south, and they have a blank look on their face, I'm like, hello, who would you call? And then so, yeah, so call the pastors um, who are affiliated with the church that I attend. So um, it's very basic, very straightforward. And we did it in less than 15 minutes around my dining room table. So that's just an example. Um, next, and we have a poll for you. Um, after getting this introduction, um, how likely do you think um, you will create a one-page profile for yourself or someone in your life? Unlikely, somewhat likely, very likely. Now or in the future. You don't have to get off this call and get to work on it. All right, thank you um, for, for letting us know that you're likely to use this. And again, you may not need to pull this uh, template out today or tomorrow. Um, you may not want to use it for the COVID-19 setting. You may want to use it in other circumstances. Um, I will tell you that some people do it uh, for their kids um, as they're starting daycare. Um, you know, what Binky, the, the, the little, boy or girl wants. Um, so it really can be repurposed for so many settings. And you can just go, um, you know, to Google and enter one page profiles, and you'll get more examples than you need. Um, so it really is something that can be used for a variety of settings. Okay, next slide. So I want to share with you um, a story of one of our um, local heroes. Uh, this is Lieutenant Steve Thomas of the Anne Arundel County, um, Maryland Police Department's crisis intervention team. And he was recently hospitalized for COVID-19. He is a member of the Maryland Traumatic Brain Injury Advisory Board. And thanks to Lieutenant Thomas, traumatic brain injury has been part of crisis intervention training curriculum for Anne Arundel County police officers for many years. You can see behind him, I put some blue arrows there in case you miss them, uh, the posters his family put together when he was in the hospital. Uh, Steve describes uh, his, his family pulling up to the hospital parking lot and the staff running out, grabbing these and, and running up to the room and putting them where he could see them. Um, and in this video, uh, and I left the link right down there in red for you. In this video, he talks about his experience uh, with his illness. He talks about how important the support was he received from his family, his department, and the community. Um, so he's somebody who's on the, on the crisis team. And so if anything goes on in Anne Arundel County um, of a, you know, a shooting or a natural disaster, he is there. And he got so much um, love and support uh, from the wider community as well as his family. So if you have a few minutes um, and you want to smile, I definitely suggest you, you check out um, Lieutenant Thomas's story on Venmo. Uh, next slide. So are there any questions? And you can, you know, put them in chat. And if you can't think of anything now, you know, send us an email. You can send me an email. Um, happy to help. So
so um, next, I do want to share with you some of the fantastic resources that are available um, to the greater community, um, brain injury and other, and other disabling conditions. There's so many uh, um, resources out there, it's almost too much. So I, I kind of curated this list for you. So the Brain Injury Association of America has some really excellent resources, um, COVID-19 resources, so check them out. The National Center on Applied Person-Centered Practices and Systems, I mentioned them earlier, um, but you'll find a video with Michael Schmoll talking about um, the one-page profile for COVID-19. If you want to get some additional reinforcement on how to use it, I strongly suggest um, to go um, to go to that as a, as a resource. They have lots and lots of good stuff there. Helen Sanderson, I mentioned her earlier. Um, she's the one that really um, developed this model to help support her daughter so that her teachers would know how to work with her in the educational setting. So lots of stuff there. I think she's in the UK. National Disability Rights Network um, has some, some good stuff there for, for folks. Um, they are across the country and every, um, every state has a disability rights uh, for their state. Green Mountain Self-Advocates, again, lots of information, that's from uh, Vermont. And then our Model Systems Knowledge Translation Center, TBI resources to stay healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic. Really, really good stuff. Again, it's almost um, an embarrassment of riches, um, but if you need something related to COVID-19, you can probably find it if you go to, to these resources. Um, next. And just general resources uh, for any of us in the community. Um, I, I just have to say I've been so impressed with how the public and behavioral health communities have acted quickly to validate the challenges of this pandemic and, and offer resources for support for the general public and for all of us. Um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, um, Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center is, is incredible, a wealth of information, and the Mayo Clinic, um, of course, longstanding um, medical go-to, and they have uh, really nice information related to coronavirus. And as, as we know, um, this virus is very fast moving and changing. We're learning new things about it every day. So um, get yourselves updated and know what's doing. Um, and those are good resources. Okay, um, next slide. I wanted to make sure you did have Michael Schmold's um, information, uh, support development associates and um, the learning uh, community for person-centered practices. So he is um, really a, pioneer and person-centered thinking practices um, in this country. Next. That's my contact. Um, feel free to email me. Um, I, I'd be happy to provide any support if you want to give it a go, or if you have any questions, or you're not sure where to find something. Um, I am happy to, to help at any time. If you think of something later on that you thought maybe I should have asked um, again, feel free to contact myself or to uh, my colleagues at NASHA and make sure that, that um, we get back to you. Um, so I'll, I'll give it back to um, Maria and Gabby. Thank you so much, Stasia. If anybody has any questions, please remember that you have the chat, the Windows pane where you can enter in your questions. So I'm just gonna give it another minute that you have an opportunity, should you have any questions or comments, please post it on the questions pane on your panel, on your control panel. <clears throat> Gabby, there is one question I see about um, whether or not the one page profile um, is in the handouts pane, and in fact, it is. Yes. Excellent. And hopefully you guys can access that. Oh. 
All right, if there's no other questions, then I just want to say thank you. If you enjoyed today's event, please stay tuned for announcements about other webinars that we have planned in 2020. Next slide. I mean, there, there are a couple of other questions. If oh, you they are. Time. Are there? Uh-huh. I, I can't uh, see any on my side. And some comments um, about, um, someone had commented about not considering using the one-page profile for hospitals before. Um, a lot of folks are not familiar with it and feel like it'll be a good um, impact on quality of care. Um, is there, Stasia, is there any type uh -huh. of compliance you have come across, um, including medication or et cetera on there? I have not, um, but I think that's why that passport is being carefully vetted um, before it's released um, because of HIPAA concerns. Um, I think we always ask the person if it's okay, of course. Um, in, in the case of, of my family member, um, she was not competent to um, give us permission, but we were, are her guardian and um, it, that was that's how we proceeded um, to share that with the uh, nursing home staff. So I think it depends on a person's situation, but we, you know we always ask the person if they're not comfortable, then we don't do it. I think that's it. Good question. Great. Sorry mm -hmm. about the interruption. No, no, it's great. All right. So if you enjoyed today's event, please stay tuned for announcements about these webinars in 2020. And of course, save the date for NASHA's State of the States Conference that's coming up this September. This year's event will be virtual to ensure everyone's health and well being while still providing you with outstanding content. Details and registration can soon be found on our website. Thank you for viewing this webinar. Please contact us to receive notice for future events and other resources. Our archived webinars are available online and we would love to have you as a member. Please visit us at www.nasha.org. Don't forget to complete your evaluations at the end of this webinar. Have a great day.